In this video, you're gonna take an in-depth look at callback functions, then we're gonna go ahead and use them to fetch some data from that Google Geolocation API. That's gonna be the API that takes an address and returns the latitude and longitude coordinates. And this is gonna be great for the weather app because the weather API we use requires those coordinates and it returns the real-time weather data. That's stuff like the temperature, the five-day forecast, wind speed, humidity, and other pieces of weather information. Now, before we get started making that request, I wanna take a few moments to talk about callback functions. And we have already used them. Right here inside of set timeout, we used a callback function. In general, a callback function is defined as a function that gets passed as an argument to another function and is executed after some event happens. Now, this is a general definition. There is no strict definition in JavaScript, but it does satisfy the function in this case. Here, we have a function and we pass it as an argument to another function, set timeout. And it does get executed after some event that event being two seconds passing. Now the event could be other things. It could be a database query finishes. It could be an HTTP request comes back. In those cases, you are gonna want a callback function like the one here to do something with that data. In the case of set timeout, we don't get any data back because we're not requesting any. We're just creating an arbitrary delay. Now, before we go ahead and actually make an HTTP request to Google, I wanna create a callback function example inside of the playground folder. Let's make a new file called callbacks.js. Inside of here, we're gonna create a contrived example of what a callback function would look like behind the scenes. We're gonna be making real examples throughout the course and we'll be using dozens and dozens of functions that require callbacks. But for now, we're gonna start with something pretty simple. To get started, let's make a variable called getUser. This is gonna be the function we'll define that's gonna show you exactly what happens behind the scenes when you pass a callback to another function. The get user callback is gonna be something that simulates what it would look like to fetch a user from a database or some sort of web API. It is gonna be a function, so we'll set it as such using arrow function, and it is gonna take some arguments. The first argument it's gonna take is the ID. This is gonna be some sort of unique number that represents each user. I might have an ID of 54, you might have an ID of 2000. Either way, we're gonna need the ID to find a user. Next up, we're gonna get a callback function. This is what we're gonna call later with the data, with that user object. This is exactly what happens when you pass a function to set timeout. The set timeout function definition looks like this. It has a callback and it has a delay. You take the callback and after a certain amount of time passes, you call it. In our case though, we're gonna switch the order with an ID first and the callback second. Now we can go ahead and call this function before actually filling it out. We're gonna call get user down below on line five, just like we did with set timeout. I'm gonna call get user passing in those two arguments. The first one is gonna be some ID. Since we're faking it for now, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna go with 31. And the second argument is gonna be the function that we wanna run when that user data comes back. And this is really important. Right here, we're gonna define that function. Now the callback alone isn't really useful. Being able to run this function after the user data comes back only works if we actually get the user data. And that's what we're gonna expect right here. We're gonna expect that the user object, things like ID, name, email, password, or whatever, comes back as an argument to the callback function. Then in here, I can actually do something with that data. I could show it on a web app, I could respond to an API request, or in our case, I can simply print it to the console. Console.log user. Now that we have the call in place, let's go ahead and fill out the get user function to work like we have it defined here. The first thing I'm gonna do is create a dummy object that's gonna be the user object. In the future, this is gonna come from database queries, but for now, we'll just create a variable user setting an equal to some object. Let's set an ID property equal to whatever ID the user passes in, and we'll set a name property equal to some name. I'm gonna go ahead and use Vikram. Now that we have our user object, what we wanna do is call the callback, passing it as an argument. Then down here, we'll be able to actually run this function printing the user to the screen. In order to do that, we would call the callback function like any other function, simply referencing it by name and adding our parentheses like this. 
Now, if we call it like this, we're not passing any data from get user back to the callback. In this case, we're expecting a user to get passed back, which is why I'm going to specify a user right here. Now, the naming isn't important. I happen to call it user here, here, and here, but I could easily call this user object and user object here. All that matters is the argument's position. In this case, we call the first argument user object, and the first argument passed back is indeed that user object. With this in place, we can now run our example over in the terminal. I'm going to run this using Node. It's in the Playground folder. And we call the file callbacks.js. When I go ahead and run the file, right away, our data prints to the screen. And this is awesome. We've created a callback function using synchronous programming. Now, as I mentioned, this is still a contrived example because there is no need for a callback in this case. We could simply return the user object, but in that case, we wouldn't be using a callback. And the whole point here is to explore what happens behind the scenes, how we actually call the function that gets passed in as an argument. Now, we can also simulate a delay using set timeout. So let's go ahead and do that before going into a real world example. Right here, I'm going to use set timeout just like we did before. I'm going to pass an arrow function in as the first argument. And I'm going to go ahead and set a delay of three seconds using 3000 milliseconds. Now I can take my callback call, delete it from line 10 and add it inside of the callback function. Callback user. Now we're not going to be responding to the get user request until three seconds have passed. Now, this is going to be more or less similar to what happens when we create real world examples of callbacks. We pass in a callback, some sort of delay happens, whether we're requesting from a database or from an HTTP endpoint, then the callback gets fired. If I save callbacks.js and rerun it from the terminal, you can see we wait those three seconds. That's the simulated delay, and then the user object prints to the screen. This is fantastic. This is exactly the principles that we need to understand in order to start working with callbacks. And that is exactly what we're going to start doing right now. Now, the request that we're going to be making to that geolocation API, it can actually be simulated over in the browser before we ever make the request in Node. And that's exactly what I want to do to get started. This is going to require you to type a kind of long URL, but hopefully you only have to type it once because it'll be saved in your browser history. So follow along for just a second. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash maps dot Google APIs dot com. Now we're going to go to forward slash maps forward slash API forward slash geocode forward slash Jason. That's it. I promise you only have to type that this one time. Hopefully it's saved in your browser history and you can simply copy and paste it. Now this is the actual endpoint URL, but we do have to specify the address for which we want to geocode. We're going to do that using query strings, which are going to be provided right after the question mark. Here we can set up a set of key value pairs, key followed by the equal sign value, and we can add multiples using the ampersand. Here we have key two equals value two. In our case, all we need is one query string address. And for the address query string, we're going to set it equal to an address. Now I'm not using my actual address, so please don't try to send me any mail. It will not get to me. In order to fill out that query address, I'm going to go ahead and start typing 1301 space Lombard Street space Philadelphia. Now you'll notice that I am using spaces here. I'm doing this to illustrate a point. You can use spaces in the browser because it's going to automatically convert those spaces to something else. But inside of Node, we're going to have to take care of that ourselves. And we'll talk about that a little later. It's super easy. For now, though, we can leave the spaces in, hit enter, and you can see they automatically get converted for us. Space characters get converted to percent %20, which is the encoded version of a space. Down below, I have all of the data that comes back. Now I'm using a extension called JSON view, which is available for Chrome and Firefox. I highly recommend installing JSON view. You can even take a moment to pause the video, install it for your browser, then refresh the page and you should see a much nicer version of your JSON data. It lets you minimize and expand various properties. It makes it super easy to navigate. Now the data below has exactly what we need. We have an address components property. We don't need that. Down below, we have a formatted address, which is really nice. 
1301 Lombard Street. It includes the state, the zip code, and the country, which I didn't even provide in the address query. Down below, though, we have what we really came for. In geometry, we have location, and this includes the latitude and longitude data. Now, what we got back from the Google Maps API request is nothing more than some JSON data, which means we can take that JSON data, convert it to a JavaScript object, and start accessing these properties in our code. To do this, we're going to use a third-party module that lets you make these HTTP requests inside of your app. This one is called Request. You can visit it by going to npmjs.com forward slash package forward slash request. When you visit that page, you're going to see all the documentation, all the different ways you can use the request package to make your HTTP requests. For now, though, we're going to stick with some basic examples. Down below on the right hand side, you can see this is a super popular package. It has 700,000 downloads in the last day, which is pretty ridiculous. In order to get started, we're going to install it inside of our project and we're going to make a request to this exact URL. To do this, let's go to the terminal first and install the module using npm init first to create that package.json file. I'm going to run npm init and use enter to use the defaults for every single option. At the end, I'll type yes and hit enter again. Now that we have our package.json file, we can use npm install, followed by the module name, request, and I am going to specify a version. You can always find the latest version of modules on the npm page if you scroll down. Here you can see 2.73.0 is the latest version at the current time that I'm filming, so I'm going to go ahead and add that at 2.73.0. Then I can specify the save flag because I do want to save this module in my package.json file. It's going to be critical for running the weather application. And now that we have the request module installed, we can go ahead and start using it. Over inside of Atom, we're going to wrap this video up by making a request to that URL in a new file in the root of the project called app.js. This is going to be the starting point for the weather application. The weather app is going to be the last command line app we create in the future. We'll be making the back end for web apps as well as real time apps using socket IO. But to illustrate asynchronous programming, a command line app is the nicest way to go. Here we have our app file and we can get started by loading in request just like we did with our other NPM modules. I'm going to make a constant variable. I'm going to call it request and I'm going to set it equal to require request. Perfect. Nothing here should look new. Now what we need to do is make a request. In order to do this, we're going to have to call this request function. Let's go ahead and call it on line three, request, and it takes two arguments. The first argument is going to be an options object where we can configure all sorts of information. We'll use that in just a second. The second one is going to be a callback function. This is going to get called once the data comes back from the HTTP endpoint. In our case, it's going to get called once that JSON data, the data right here, comes back into the node application. Back inside of Atom, we can add the arguments that are going to get passed back from request. Now, these are arguments that are outlined in the request documentation. I'm not making up the names for these. Here in the docs, you can see they call it error, response, and body. That's exactly what we're going to call ours. Back inside of Atom, we can add error, response, and body just like they do. Now from here, we can go ahead and fill out that options object. This is where we are going to specify the things unique to our request. In this case, one of the unique things is the URL. The URL specifies exactly what you want to request. And in our case, we have that in the browser. Let's go ahead and copy the URL exactly as it appears, pasting it inside of the string for the URL property. Now that we have the URL property in place, we can add a comma at the very end and hit enter because we are going to specify one more property. We're going to set JSON equal to true. And this tells request that the data coming back is going to be JSON data, and it should go ahead and take that JSON string and convert it to an object for us. That lets us skip a step. It's a really useful option. With this in place, we can now do something in the callback. In the future, we'll be taking this longitude and latitude and fetching weather. For now, we're simply going to print the body to the screen. Console.log, printing body. Right here, 
I'm going to pass the body argument into console.log. Now that we have our very first HTTP request set up and we have a callback that's going to fire when the data comes back, we can run it from the terminal. To do this, like you might expect, we're going to use node and we're going to run that app.js file. When we do this, the file is going to start executing and there's going to be a really short delay before the body prints to the screen. As you saw, it really wasn't that long, maybe a fifth of a second, maybe even less. And what we get back is exactly what we saw in the browser. Some of the properties like address components show object in this case because we're printing it to the screen, but those properties do indeed exist. We'll talk about how to get them a little later. For now though, we do have our formatted address right here. We also have the geometry object, the place ID and types. This is what we're gonna be using to fetch the longitude and latitude and later to fetch the weather data. A few students reported getting the following error in the response body over query limit. If you're seeing that, or if you're not, I recommend heading over to this URL. This URL is gonna redirect you to a course Q&A on Udemy. In one of my replies, I list out a guide for how you can fix it. Now I recommend doing this even if you're not getting any error right now and you are seeing the expected output. That's gonna make sure that you don't run into any issues in the next several videos. All right, that's it for the update. Let's dive back into the regular video. Now that we have this in place, we are done. We have the first step of the process complete. We've made a request to the Google Geolocation API and we're getting the data back. We'll continue on creating the weather app in the next video. I am super excited to get started building it out. So stay tuned. I will see you soon.